Hi there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Cloud Based Mayhem. Got a great show for you today. I'm on the road right now. Started in Vancouver a few days ago and I'm going to end in, uh, well, hopefully San Diego. Hope we can get a venue here in a couple days, but just been uh, showing north to known some, to some great audiences along the way. It's been really fun to see people light up and just kind of uh, the film's blown people's minds and that's that's really fun. It was a project we worked really hard on for a long time and Cross Country Magazine, uh, Ed Ewing and uh, Hugh Miller are putting together another little short tour for me in the UK. So those of you who uh, listen to the show and, and live in the UK, uh, keep an eye on that on my Facebook page and Cross Country's Facebook page and the interwebs. I'll be coming over there the weekend of the 8th of April uh, for a few shows. We're actually going to do a clinic up at uh, Jockey Sanderson's Flight Park little day with me in the air and talking about Volbiv and the X Alps and some of that stuff so that should be really fun. One little bit of housekeeping um, I have been hearing on the road and from a few of you in emails uh, that we need to work on our sound levels. Um, we know we're having that problem you know, when, when I do these interviews on the other end uh, people are on Skype and it can be just really tricky like if they move around or uh, it, and anyway, we know we have that problem and we're working really hard on it and I think we're going to solve it. Uh, I'm also going to be sending out microphones to future guests so they've got uh, good mics on their end before we even do the podcast. So thank you for that feedback. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention was that we take your uh, comments and your suggestions for uh, other podcast people to come on the show, other guests, uh, very, very seriously. So please reach out. Uh, I try to get back personally to every single person that, that, that emails in. So if you've got a question or uh, something that hasn't been answered on the podcast or a guest you really want to see on the show, yeah, for sure, reach out, let me know. Uh, let's go ahead and get right into this one. Uh, in the last X Alps, I uh, got the opportunity to do some training with Nick Nainans, a Kiwi out of New Zealand and he did really well in the race, had a brutal start. I think he was first off the hill there at the Geisberg and uh, was leading the leading the punch out to the, the first waypoint at Dockstein and then he had a problem with his wing so he top landed and I think he was uh, either last or way off the back uh, at the end of the first day. And he crawled back and made some awesome moves and uh, came in 10th and he has a very untraditional style. I, I dig this guy's style, you know, a lot of the X Alps he did in jandals, uh, for those of us in the States over here, sandals, uh, I think like a pair of Crocs or something, uh, had a very untraditional approach to training, and by that I mean he just kind of tramps through the woods, but I don't think he had any real strict training regimen going into the race. Uh, he flies very creative lines, he's got a deep, passionate love for his his uh, home country of New Zealand. He's also a meteorologist and he, he got into flying just because he loves spending time in the mountains and he, he goes out and does some some pretty neat things. I think he broke the record this year for distance or triangle distance in New Zealand and he's uh, he's back for more this time around in the X Alps which I was kind of surprised at. I didn't think that that was going to be kind of his his thing. He seems to just uh, just enjoy flying and not really counting the numbers and not racing. And, and uh, But he's back for another go at the X Alps and I thought it'd be really fun to sit down with him. Uh, a friend of his, Tom Lines, who he was doing some flying with in Australia, sent me an email a while back. I've had several people like Tom ask to get Nick on the show because he's uh, yeah, he's got he's just got a different approach. So we get into some of those approaches and and uh, how he views flying and safety, and uh, he's flown all over the world, so he gives us some beta on where where folks should go to do their first bull bibs, and yeah, I think you're gonna really enjoy this. Nick's a fascinating character, and he's, uh, he's really creative in the air. I saw that uh, before we flew in the X-Alps together, and then uh, certainly during the race. I don't think we ever saw each other actually during the race, but he made some really, really incredible moves to, to get back from where he was to where he ended up. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Nick Nainans. Nick, uh, gosh, it's awesome to have you on the show. And uh, in, incredibly, I don't think I've seen you since the first day of the X Alps. It's, it's hard to imagine that you and I raced all the way across the spine of that uh, that entire mountain range and, and never really saw each other. I saw you 
top land brilliantly on that first day and uh, got yourself in a in a pretty in a tough situation those first few days and then man you came roaring back uh congratulations for that and uh i'm sure we'll be talking about the x alps but um before we get into it where are you and what are you doing these days so i'm in sydney i've just moved here and i've started my job as a meteorologist which i did training for last year in melbourne so yeah it's obviously something that's interesting to me as a paraglider pilot and it's given me a chance to learn about it in more detail. So, yeah, as I've been paragliding about 10 years now, so I know a lot of the micrometeorology stuff from experience, but it's good to get another perspective. And I got that actually with flying with a sailplane pilot in New Zealand uh, a few years ago, which really helped me improve my flying. But, yeah, this is um, doing it through this mathematics and looking at a, a wider area, so that's been interesting. Yeah, you know, I, I've got to uh, I've got to read something to you that uh, you know Tom Lines, I think a friend of yours was was the one that really reached out a few months ago, and he said, "God, man, you you got to get Nick on the show," which I've kind of wanted to do anyway, just to get your perspectives because I know you your approach to paragliding is is uh, much different, I think, than than most. We'll talk about that, but uh, it, in his email, and this is going to make you blush. I, I I know you're a very hum humble character, but. Uh, that dude can send it and look as casual as a palm tree in pajamas while being as humble as the sand he walks on. He flies Volbiv with nothing but his flip-flops and a kilogram of cheese. He doesn't eat the cheese, just ages it. Some say he can photosynthesize. Others say he was raised by wild yet really relaxed and true to themselves albatross. <laughs> he runs a catch and release program. For, <laughs> he runs a catch and release program for thermals that have run away from home. <laughs> <laughs> I just loved that. So your uh, your background and in, in, in your uh, passion for meteorology must must help you uh, catch these thermals that are run away from home. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I didn't know you were so creative. Yeah, we shared a, a drive or two to Bright, so um, got a chance to chat with him on those long Australian drives. Yeah, but, trying, trying yeah, to miss the kangaroos. About, about being humble, that, that's before the X-Alps. Now I'm pretty full of myself. Totally changed totally <laughs> Yeah, it, it does that a little bit, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think I need another Excel to put me back in my place. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure it's uh, it, it. It I'm sure it gives us a little bit of uh, everything. Well, we're going to have that opportunity here in a few months. And uh, what I'd I'd love to talk about, you know, for those who don't know much of your history, you know, we were talking before we hit the record here that you got into flying to really explore the mountains in New Zealand. Can you kind of expand on that and how that all, what was the impetus? Yeah. So like when I was in Switzerland, walking through the Alps with dad, when I was a young teenager, we saw paragliders, but I don't remember like kind of what I thought about it at that point. And I remember even climbing up Mount Earnslaw in New Zealand years and years ago. I was probably in my late teens then. We saw this German guy with a huge backpack coming down the mountain and uh, yeah, he, he had a paraglider with him and I'm not sure if it even clicked then and reading uh, Dad's diary um, from years ago, he wrote about seeing paragliders in Nelson in New Zealand and thinking that it would be a great thing and you should take it up one day. But yeah, I don't know what I thought about it at those points, but back in 2006, I thought, you know, I've done a lot of backcountry hiking, um, or we call it tramping, in New Zealand, and some of the bush there is pretty pretty rough going. Like, one time I spent half an hour going 30 metres, kind of like swimming upwards through the bush. So to, to be able to fly over the bush and cut out like a day of hard labour <laughs> with a really nice glide is it's kind of the idea that got me into it. Mm. And so I had a look on the internet and I saw that these paragliders only weigh like five or six kilos and I almost couldn't believe it. So I rang up the uh, local instructor in southeast Queensland and uh, went down on my motorbike a couple of hours um, from where I was living, or an hour and a half, had a chat to him for I think it was most of the morning and basically decided to do it then. I learned and basically I just jumped in both feet. I didn't... Uh, didn't really need to try it out. I sort of knew that I'd do it. So I just signed up for the course, um, bought gear and started flying. 
And did you, you know, just from, from knowing you and flying with you before, you know, you, you and I did a little bit of training together before the X Alps and then just watching, you know, I was, I'm working on this book about the, the experience there. And it was really fun after the race to go back through and watch all of us, you know, cause they, you could, you could kind of replay the whole thing. You made some really brilliant moves and, but I, I, I gather that your real passion is kind of vol biv. It's not, it's not necessarily competition. Is that correct? Am I, am I right there? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think I'd like competitions if I did better in them. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. No, Volbiv, the great thing about Volbiv is that, like, for me, it's kind of being able to get the most out of the day. And when you're in a competition, you're kind of sitting on a hillside and you're only flying in that peak time of the day, like the, you know, early well, – mid-afternoon when the thermals are strong enough and all this kind of thing. But some of my best and most memorable flights have been really late in the evening or just early morning glides. And, yeah, like some days they're not flyable generally, but there are periods where you can fly here and there. So what's great about Volbiv is that you, you sort of got sunrise to sunset or dawn to dusk to, to do your flying rather than that just shorter afternoon period. Mm. And the other thing is that I'd much rather be – hiking through the mountains with the wing not being able to fly than sitting on a hill talking to depressed paraglider pilots about <laughs> when the weather's going to change. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Very, very good point. And you you live in a, in a part of the world, I, I know New Zealand well. I've spent a lot of time down there. The weather changes uh, radically fast uh, like it did on us in, in Alaska. And uh, Yeah, you're right. And to stay sane, I think you got to grab it when you can. Yeah, for sure. And sometimes a five minute flight is all the fix you need, you know, and it just with cross country, we kind of reduce flying to a number sometimes how many Ks you flew. And if you're flying the same kind of route and you don't go as far, then it's, yeah, it's maybe hard to keep upbeat about it. But when you're doing Volbiv and you just have a short flight off a mountain, it just uh, like it's a memory that you'll never forget kind of thing. So, yeah. I think, I think some of those short flights like that were, what was I mean, for me, and there were a lot of special things about the X Alps, but those short flights were really, boy, they can be neat. You know, you just get these tiny little whiffs of, of perfection, and uh, even if they're really they're really short, are they just they're like the saving grace of that race, isn't it? I mean, they just they reset everything and they make you they let you forget your pain and the hurts and and uh, uh, they're really special. Yeah, totally. When you were saying that, it just reminded me of my first uh, like. X event, which was um, the X Berg, organised by one of the previous um, X Alps competitors, Pierre from South Africa, mm. and that was through the Drakensberg, and it was six days, and it was quite amazing. Like I flew every day, several flights every day. Out of all my flights, I never flew more than 10 k's. So you'd think that that'd be a terrible comp if you can't even fly 10 k's. But actually, the flights were really amazing they made a huge difference mm. and uh it also was like a, an amazing adventure like I, I just at the end of it i thought that's amazing i want to do something like that again nick your 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 kind of passion for volbev is i think you and i share a lot of that my my first big one that i did across the sierras with uh nick Reese and those guys at the end of it i was just super ecstatic one day we weren't actually quite done and and i was i was interviewing nick and i was saying you know don't don't you think everybody should be doing this and he was like dude are you fucking crazy no it's like because he was talking about the the risks you know we were because we were we were flying i guess it's kind of you know you're flying at the upper limit of of what paragliders can do at times you know i mean of course you can pick your days and that kind of thing but um i i you know knowing you and and what you're willing to fly in and what we were all flying in in the x alps how how would you recommend people that haven't done any volbiv you know what what's the progression there what's the you know when you think back about how you got into it you know because in the beginning you're you're it's demanding. You're you're top landing. You're you're landing in really tight spots. You're often landing in conditions that are not ideal. Like you're talking about, it's not the middle of the day competition type flying where it's perfect. It's you know it's between storm systems. It's in heavy wind. How how would you recommend people, you know, stick their toe in the water? Yeah, well, I remember when I first let my paragliding instructor Phil Hostek. I said I went down and had a chat with him months before I started. I signed up for the course. 
and I um, alluded to him that I wanted to go flying in the mountains in New Zealand and would it be possible? And he basically said, first, you've got to learn how to fly. <laughs> and very uh, stern instructor and known for scaring his students at times, but that was probably good for me, you know. Mm. So, yeah, I, I did get to New Zealand six months after, you know, first signing up for the course. And, yeah, it was pretty uh, – intense that first summer it was amazing like I still remember the flights of course yeah I guess that first few years of flying I was not doing amazing cross countries but I was learning a lot of the other skills that you need in the mountains like safe launches safe landings that heaps of ground handling and reading the meteorology so like you know reading the sky or figuring out what's going on like I've always like before meteorology I before doing the course last year, I still knew a lot about meteorology from reading and kind of figuring everything out through physics. Like it's all physics, right? So trying to understand things and figuring it all out and then getting a chance to test those things over and over again. But in terms of cross countries, wasn't doing anything amazing. And I remember thinking that probably it would have been beneficial to do more coastal flying actually in when I was learning because you get a lot better value in terms of time in the air and uh, time on the wing, time to figure out how to control the wing because at the start when you learn there's a lot of different things to think about and you want to have as many of them completely automatic as possible and we'd spend all day like trying to go to an inland site and sometimes you don't even fly at all. I remember going to a site in southeast Queensland and there was five top pilots there and we all sat on the hill all day because even the good guys get the conditions wrong sometimes. But if you're on the coast, you know, you can fly and if you bomb out, you walk up the hill, it takes two minutes. So it's it's a better way to get into it. But, yeah, I flew the same school wing, the, the old Bolero Plus, um, that I learnt on for two years, so a really long time. And in that time, I done Volbivs in New Zealand and the Alps. Like I wasn't going very far, but I was learning all those other skills. And yeah, I guess that's one of the things that helped me progress is to get a new wing. But basically I was more focused on traveling and 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 learning rather than uh, yeah, buying gear and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you mentioned in your in your blog post, which I invite the listeners to go check out. It's called sharemyjoys.wordpress.com. Uh, There's some some really good writing there, um, and your your blog post about the training for the the 2015 X Alps has some really fascinating stuff in it. And I think one of the things that jumps out, at least to me, is when you're talking about training. You know, I think of training for the X Alps as the physical. Uh, of course, there's the, way more important is the flying side, but but you you really elaborate on you know uh, the value of flying without instruments, the value of ground handling, the value of learning how to land in a tight spot. You, you mentioned before we started that you you, know, you spent a couple years off. You took a couple years off and just did as much flying as you could. When, when did it kind of occur to you to that the X Alps was a possibility? Yeah, so before I took that two years off, I was, I would say my skills, aside from cross country, were very good. I mean, I'd done obviously cross countries, but nothing spectacular. Uh, like in New Zealand, I was flying under 50 k's most of the time. And uh, in that two years, I really improved my cross country skills, probably partly to do with the the amazing wing, which is you know the best wing in the world for that kind of thing. The first event I did was the Exberg, which was in the Drakensberg in South Africa, as I mentioned before. And that was basically like a convenient thing because I had a mate in Cape Town who I stayed with for part of the month. And later on there was that event, so it just tied in with my plans pretty well and it was a good chance to to go and see the place when it's semi-organised, like any competition. But, yeah, this was a XL style competition. And, yeah, it was just amazing fun so I put together all my skills and there was something new it was like a, a defined purpose so sometimes I find in Volbiv that I'm not exactly sure uh, what I'm trying to do and sometimes decision making like should you take off or should you keep your height or should you have a meal or should you just keep walking 
it's kind of hard to do. But with if you've got a set goal in mind to get to the other end, then it kind of means it's easier in terms of decision making. You just got to keep going. Well, there's still lots of decisions to make, but at least um, it takes some of that away. So yeah, that was really fun, and I found that I think it was the first or second night I was walking up a, a road in the dark, and I thought actually I quite enjoy this. <laughs> Never thought I'd enjoy walking on the road, but maybe uh, something like the X-Alps would be fun after all. So I didn't commit in my head to doing the X-Alps at that point, but I did straight away sign up for the X-Pier as soon as I'd finished the race. And one of the other guys who was in that race signed up for the X-Pier, but he had to pull out. So um, he told me who to contact and I got accepted and the X-Pier was amazing as well. So after the XP, I thought, well, maybe it is possible to have fun in a race like the X-Alps after all. Because I had heard, I mean, I've obviously followed the X-Alps before and you do see a lot of people that seem like they're struggling a bit. I mean, Kriegel seems like he's having an amazing time, but some of the other guys, they, they seem like they're really going through it with, uh, you know, blisters and sore legs and all this kind of thing. So. And you're, you know, you're, uh, <laughs> I have to say, it seemed like, at least, unless you were just faking it, your, your approach uh, in terms of the lead up, I think was quite untraditional. <laughs> Do you want to share thoughts on that? Well, yeah. Yeah. I would say that, yeah. So when I first got accepted back in November, you know, seven months before the race, I thought, oh, I'll sign up for all these endurance events and all this kind of thing. And then after a couple of months, I thought, nah, nah, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. And I remember talking to 30, you know, the Dutch ex Alps guy. Mm hmm. And um, I just asked him, I sent him a message, said, what's the story like, what what do I need to do for x -Alps? And he wrote back saying, if you're like an average Kiwi, you'll be fit enough. Just go fly 200 Ks in New Zealand. So I'm like, hmm, okay, fair <laughs> enough. And pretty much ran with that. <laughs> yeah, that's. I think that's his approach, and he, and he does pretty well every time, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's pretty consistent, yeah. I've been lucky enough to be spending most of my life like doing tramping trips on and off here and there in my holidays and whatever. So I've got a lot of good fitness from that. And I've seen a lot of the guys in the X Alps, um, you know, when I was following years before I did it myself. And I was talking to my uh, neighbour, uh, Mark, the farmer in New Zealand, who um, was looking at the X Alps as well. And he's going, it looks like none of these, a lot of these guys have never really gone for a walk before. So it's not like I've gone in cold. It's it's just I haven't had a structured training program. And basically my training has been tramping. So when you're tramping, it's kind of a lot of the time it's sort of off the track. But I guess I don't know if that helps at all. But there's a lot of decision making involved in when you're in the hills in New Zealand. So like you've got to you've got to have a big picture. You can't just follow the signs kind of thing. So I think that helps a lot. You you've got to be able to read a map. You've got to manage your your body basically and I've always had the attitude of me and my body are on the same team there's no need to uh break through any pain barriers or anything like we're actually working on this together so I I try to listen to my body and on the other hand my body's pretty patient with me as well so in the lead up to the last one, you, you kind of had this two years off and I, I understand now, you know, you, you've got this full-time job. Is your approach going into this one any, any different or desires, goals? Is the X Alps just purely, you just want to have fun? Yeah. So the, having fun was kind of the goal last time, but last time I had it in my head that, you know, this might be the only chance I've got. So I probably should think about, you know, doing everything the right way and not regretting it later on. And, uh, yeah, Louis was an amazing supporter. He uh, he put a lot of effort into it and he was pretty thorough. And uh, it was a pretty professional approach that we had. But after the x -Alps, I went to South America and um, sometimes I don't know how I managed to travel at all. So... <laughs> totally disorganized I'd just like get out of the bus I would have had a look at the map but I've got like a map of you know the Andes which is not, not a lot of detail in there and I'll just think oh I could probably fly from there and then I have a look at my uh, Oryx maps on my phone and see if I can walk from a road to a launch and then I just go to some random place and uh, climb 
climb up and fly. And sometimes it worked and it was amazing. And that's kind of what I'm going for this time is where you invest even less into it and you can still sometimes manage to get an amazing payoff. And it kind of feels like you're getting something for nothing. Like for me, paragliding is a sport where you, you kind of, it, it's a good sport for tight ass. Like if you're a tight ass, cause you can basically get high for free. So you, you can use nature's energy to your advantage and it's a sport where you can carry everything on your backpack. You're not reliant on anyone. You don't uh, need to get a helicopter to launch or you, you can just go out on your own. So that's one of the, the beauties of the sport. So to, to be able to invest nothing into it, but like just jump out of a bus and if it doesn't work, get back in the bus, you haven't lost anything. That's really attractive to me. So that's kind of what I'm going for. This X-Alps, I'm still going to make sure that I um, am prepared enough to have a good time, but I don't need to structure it so much. And as I said, I'm quite full of myself, so I think I can pull it off, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> and then will, will Louis be your supporter again? Uh, Louis is probably going to be lots of help, but I'm thinking of making it, yeah, a much smaller event and just getting my family involved actually and and in a way like it's good to have people who aren't too involved just so they can relax because I think the most dangerous part of the X Alps is actually the driving. I'm sure there's been a lot of near misses with a lot of the supporters just because they're so fatigued and distracted by the tracking and everything else that's going on and um, it's easy to lose track of yeah, the fact that you're on a dangerous road. So, yeah, that's that's kind of like one of my biggest worries and I think that it's important for the supporters to, to make sure they put themselves first and support you as a secondary thing because if they can't, you know, if they're struggling to stay awake or they're running out of juice or whatever, then they're not going to be any much help to anyone. Mm. Yeah, it's it's really intense on them. They're, they're truly the unsung heroes, isn't it? They're, that's a tough go. For sure. So one of the things that I, I've been kind of battling with going into this one is I, you know, I had shoulder surgery in October. So I haven't, you know, I had all these flying plans this winter to Colombia and Mexico and Brazil and stuff that I canceled because of the shoulder surgery. And I'm just now being able to start to fly again. It sounds like uh, you're in a similar boat, but not because of an injury, but because of your job. Is there any, are you worried about at all about not having as much time under your belt as you did last time? Because I know last time you said you were, you had basically two years off and you were flying a ton. Yeah, so that is a big difference for sure. Um, I remember a mate that I had, well, I still have, in uh, southeast Queensland complaining about not being current and all that kind of thing. So I was thinking about that. I spent a year in Antarctica, and when I came back, I got that my new wing that I'd never flown a D before, I jumped on a D and just got straight into it, and I thought I'd blow this currency thing out of the water. And, yeah, I think... Like, obviously, it's mostly in your head paragliding. So, yeah, I've tested that theory again by hardly flying at all last year. And then I still had a reasonable summer in New Zealand. I mean, the the problem was there was plenty of wind. But I think when I flew, I flew quite well. So I don't think it really matters so much that I haven't flown, as, as long as you think it doesn't matter. It's like the elephant, uh, Dumbo, flying <laughs> you, you know the story of course yeah <laughs> i like that just trick yourself yeah. <laughs> yeah you you mentioned earlier the the best wing in the world what 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 wing are you flying are you, are you on the lm5 yeah so that was um at the time like the the wing that dominated the x alps so i watched the x alps from antarctica and thought yep that kind of suits me because it's a wing that's designed for all conditions and yeah, it's for the type of flying that I want to be doing. So I kind of stepped up after a year of not flying, but I think it was made sense. Like I was going to get a lot of time pretty quick anyway. So, yeah. Mm. And so that's what you'll, will you be on that or the, the six, I guess, in this race? Oh gosh. I, <laughs> I've got no idea what's going on this time. You think it'd be an easier decision. Like I, I, last time we kind of, left it a bit late and we didn't get the wing till just before the event so i don't really want that to happen again but yeah i've got to figure that out soon so yeah at the moment i've been trying to get my computer running and sort out some other stuff like yeah, i'm a little bit disorganized but that's uh, on the list of things to figure out for sure you uh you mentioned in your blog uh the importance of of ground handling um 
how did you how did how do you approach that and do you still is that is that still a big part of your kind of routine so when we learned um that was emphasized that we had to ground handle a lot one of the places i really got to ground handle a lot was a little site in our north of brisbane called the playground where it's kind of really small and, and friendly and there's loads of places you can land and sometimes i take off and land 30 seconds later like on the launch and and you could just, you know, there's a sea breeze in the afternoon and just little thermals and you could just muck around. And often I would have more fun actually ground handling than flying. Like it's it's really quite fun. So, uh, yeah, I ground handled my mate's wing the other day down at the beach, just, well, on the grass to get the, the sand out. Yeah, it is really fun, like just manipulating it to, to get exactly what you want. But actually since getting the LM5 which is a lightweight wing I haven't really done any ground handling apart from like naturally when I'm pulling the wing up to launch so I don't actually go out and practice it anymore but it's still like I've still got it uh the reason I don't practice it is because I don't want to wear out the wing but I'm actually getting an Enzo soon so that might be fun to ground handle uh yeah I do I do love ground handling and it, again, it's one of those things that can be a lot better value than flying if you're spending hours to drive to a site, sitting on the hill when it's too windy and then driving home again. You might be better off just going to the park and ground handling for a couple of hours. When you when you think about flying these days, uh, given the, the job that you have now, what's, you know, what's kind of, I mean, obviously the X-Alps are in your future, but what has you kind of excited about flying or what are you thinking about um, doing either between now and the X-Alps or in, and after, like, you know, reading your blog, you, you spent some time in the Indian Himalaya. You, you did some really cool flying, which I want to ask you about in the Caucasus, because that's been kind of on my radar for a while. South America. Uh, yeah. You, you've been to a lot of really neat places to fly. Is that still, uh, those kind of things still right up there for you or is it more, uh, your job right now? Yeah, for sure. There's still loads of places to go to. And um, a lot of places that I'll, you'd think that you'd be back in a couple of years, but it takes a lot longer. Like India, for example, I revisited, but it took me, I don't know, eight years or something to get back there. But, um, yeah, definitely keen to do a lot more stuff. But, yeah, I am focusing on the job at the moment. That two years was a bit of a sort of break to get it out of my system. Yeah, it, it was great fun, but part of the idea was to go to the places that are a little bit less accessible and that you need to spend a bit longer to go to so yeah um the biggest i remember the first time i went to south america which was just before i learned to fly you know it's a really big continent and it takes a long time to get around and i thought this is all pretty cool but in terms of nature we've pretty much got it all in new zealand and it's so close and yeah really new zealand's the place that's got me most excited about flying lately like all last year i was planning flights uh, new lines to do in New Zealand in the summer and even now I'm thinking of a sneaky little trip uh, next month so it's kind of the most accessible place for me where I live to go and fly but mm. there's definitely a lot of places to explore around the world as well but kind of that's on the back burner for now I've uh, still got to negotiate getting leave for excels from <laughs> from work so uh, <laughs> better, better uh, keep, chill out for a while <laughs> Well, the Caucasus. What was the, what was the mission there, and and uh, how did it all go down? So, a mate who cycled from London back to Australia with his uh, partner, uh, he recommended two places for me to go. One was Georgia, and the other one was Kyrgyzstan. And I, I went to both, and Georgia was quite convenient for me because someone. Uh, basically the boyfriend of an ex-flatmate that I contacted on Facebook is working there with the Red Cross in Tbilisi. So he said, yeah, come around and you can stay at my place as long as you like. So in true style, I, I, I took him up on his offer, whether he meant it or not. <laughs> and uh, yeah, spent basically the month in Tbilisi and went off to do the side trips here and there. I went there in May and the weather was really unstable, like you'd get storms and then the same day you'd get more storms and more storms. It was crazy. But there was um, enough 
um, good weather in there for me to do some some great trips. And you don't need much time with paragliding. A few hours here or there, if you're in the right place, can give you a pretty awesome experience uh, that that makes makes it worthwhile sitting around for a few few days. So yeah, I had some great flights in uh, Spinetti in the the kind of west, which is like a little bit more humid than the east, and it, it basically looks the same as Switzerland. Big glaciers, green grass, and yeah, wild place to fly. You can see Mount Elbrus in the distance as you flew along. Mm. Yeah, a few other flights uh, near Casbegi, which is more accessible to the capital. Maybe give me a list if 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 someone you know listening to the show decided, yeah, okay, I want to do I want to do some vol biv. Would you could you give a little five pointer list of where you would start and maybe where you would end for me? Like the Alps is a pretty good place. Like it's very convenient with logistics. And if you're not really sure about things, it's kind of a good place to start because you've got lots of um, exit options. Uh, the Pyrenees is also quite good. The, there's loads of grassy landings everywhere as long as you're in the deep Pyrenees, not out in the, in the desert, out in the, you know, the Spanish side where it, gets a bit thorny and, and dry. Yeah, Kyrgyzstan was an amazing place, but you really got to be pretty confident by the time you get there. Like, the, it was pretty wild conditions. I mean, it's different at different times of the year, I assume, but, yeah, some pretty rough air, I'd say. But there's landings everywhere, mm. and it's amazing culturally. Uh, New Zealand is super remote, but if you know where you're going, you can have some great trips there. You've also got problems with the weather but the great thing about New Zealand is there's big wide open valleys so even if there's a bit of wind around um, there's often plenty of landing options. The Himalaya pretty tricky in terms of landings I guess it depends when you go we were kind of stuck pretty low most of the time in the uh, yeah the spring there was a lot of moisture around and a lot of storms and we couldn't get super high. South America that place is wild <laughs> The air is crazy uh, in the Andes because it's so dry and the air is so thin and, and the, the sun is tropical. It, that place is <laughs> – I, I uh, actually had my brake line unsheathed because the air was so active that I had worn it through uh, in South America. <laughs> yeah, big, strong climbs. Yeah. Oh, man. It sounds like home. It's so crazy. It goes from – like it – once I landed before midday, because it was just like, oh, this is too too much for me. This is too hardcore. I was getting sucked up like crazy. And then, yeah, anyway, yeah. <laughs> Good place. Um, yeah, I don't know. Where where else would you go? Uh, they, I think you just, you, you ticked a lot of them right there. I mean, you know, where, where I fly at home is is probably pretty similar to the Andes. You know, it's... Uh, it's it's yeah, not it a, it's be. not a it's not a super kind place to send people for their first vol biv because you're you're fighting a couple of things. One is you know the the you get really high base. You know we we fly with oxygen, so that that's kind of hard to yep. top up on oxygen when you're flying vol biv. And then uh, and the 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 thermals are incredibly strong. And then there's there's a quite a lack of we're in the desert, so we're, there's a lack of water. If if you go in the spring, there's tons of lakes and streams and stuff but if you go in the fall yeah. when it's more reliable or even in the summer then you know water becomes an issue it won't be as much of an issue this year because we're having a massive snow year but so this will be an interesting yeah, right. interesting season but um uh switching gears here a little bit but uh accidents have you had any or uh, had any experience with injuries or silly stuff yeah after six months of flying in India, I racked up more hours than I had in the previous six months in just a couple of weeks, which was great. But, yeah, I was trying to um, push myself a little bit with the cross-country, but I think the actual problem was lack of confidence. So basically I freaked out about landing down below because I was hearing them talk about power lines everywhere, and I tried to land on this – slope landing like a little slot in between the trees and I just kind of flew in and uh, hit the the ground pretty hard with my feet and I think I would have broken my back probably four times if I hadn't had the really uh, strong message from my instructor to keep your 
your landing gear out when you're anywhere near the ground. So yeah, I came out of that with a bruised heel and I was still able to sort of hobble off launch the next day and fly. So that was my worst injury for a while. But I managed to do the same thing again last year on the coast, just uh, sort of got a little bit low with, you know, the ocean below and a few cliffs and I freaked out and um, went for the same thing, a, a bit of a dodgy safe uh, face landing. And really the problem was I think that I didn't round out at the end and, and if I was completely relaxed, I think I would have done a better landing, but I just sort of ploughed it in because <laughs> I was not really confident about where I was at. So, yeah, but they're the um, injuries that I've had. The So both of them, I was just hobbling around for a bit, but nothing serious. But the other close calls I've had have been crashing into cables in the Alps, and that's one of the things I'm most worried about over there for sure. Gosh, I did this. Um, I went over there this, this summer right after Alaska. I went over there just to do some training with, with Bruce and, and Ben, and I – I, I don't think I realized it until I got there, but I, you know, I think Alaska took a lot more out of me than I realized. I think I was on such a high from completing it that I maybe was feeling the kind of adrenaline we do in the X Alps. And so I, I went over to Europe all happy Larry and, uh, and I got in the air and I, I just, I wasn't feeling it. You know how you, you, you're, you're, uh, yeah. you know, when you're just, you're not there and, and you know, in the, in the conditions were not, that terrible. I mean, they weren't great. It was windy and it was, you know, it was demanding, but nothing like some of the days in the X Alps where I always felt like I had it. it this was a time where I felt like I, yeah. I didn't. And I ended up in a place at the end of one day where I, I literally three or four times, you know, right one after another, you know, it was the kind of thing where I went over a cable that I didn't see with like six inches of clearance and then went under a cable that I didn't see with like six inches of clearance. I mean, it was just, and like really high, big cables where the outcome would have been horrible. And I never, I never even saw them. It just got it. And you know, and you, you train yourself yeah. to look for that kind of stuff, but it was like, I don't know if it was, it was cause I was tired or, but yeah, that stuff, that stuff is scary. <laughs> I think, Super scary. And I, I think some of them, it really impossible to see. Yeah, like they, I do too. If they've got a pole at the top or the bottom, you can look at that and infer that there might be a cable. But some of them just come straight out of the ground. They they have hay brought, being brought down from paddocks, and there's some trees on the top of the cliff, and it just comes straight off the, the ground level. Like there's no indication at all. Yeah, so those, it's pretty those, scary. Those cables that come down, that you know, they're not being used for lifts or anything. They're just the ones that are just almost like hanging down. There's a, I was doing a yeah. flight near Interlock and one time very close to airspace, so I was trying to kind of hug the terrain. Same thing. You just um, note to listeners: if you are flying around cables, one hint is to uh, make sure you don't have polarized sunglasses on. I know I've been told that that's that makes it a lot worse, but. I always fly with polarized sunglasses, so maybe, that, maybe I need to take those yeah, off. Me too. But, <laughs> maybe that's not a good idea. Yeah, I've, I've been told that they, they make them almost invisible. Um, they take the gear out, don't they? So yeah, they really right. flash see going up and down the wire. Exactly, yeah. Nick, when, when I got done, when we got to Monaco, uh, and I've talked about this a few times, but you know, when we were sitting around that night in the campground uh, with I think, you know, Aaron Duragati was there and Paul Gusselbauer and Ferdy and, and, uh, you know, we were having some beers and we we're all in a very good mood, of course. But then the, we started telling the, you know, the, the, uh, the scary stories and, and it was a real, uh, I think I was on such a high that I was there. I'd, I'd forgotten about that stuff. And I was surprised that everybody, I, I'd had a really bad situation, uh, going over the ski area near Vars, Vals, Vars, somewhere there, you know, Southern France, kind of on that last yeah. leg, uh, where I was called the valley. Yeah, exactly. I was trying to, uh, I was actually trying to get over one of the little, uh, snowmaking ponds to, to just ditch it and save my life. I got caught in this terrific downdraft that I didn't realize I was in until too late. And I was, you know, on the backside of a about a 60 kilometer an hour or more, uh, Valley breeze. It was just really, really, anyway, bad position. So I was relating that story and some of the other guys were relating some, some also really scary stories. Do you, did you have any in the race? And, and, and also, you know, how do you, how do you justify something like the X Alps? Probably helps having a really uh, bad memory. <laughs> <laughs> 
love it. Yeah. Uh, there, there was one time where I was in some super crazy air. The, the first notable thing that happened to me in the X Alps when, was when I was going backwards on full speed. But I thought that was pretty impressive. But that actually wasn't a problem because I just sort of pushed to try and get in front of a spur. And as I sank down, the wind picked up. But it was all smooth, sort of laminar kind of wind. And all I had to do was turn around and go back to the previous spur that I'd just been on, saw up, and then I was kind of out of the wind again, and I could get out of the wind that way. So sometimes uh, people tell you when you're learning that if the conditions are too rough or strong or whatever, then go and land. But in the Alps, I've adapted that. In the X Alps, I should say, or or if you're in some vulgar situation, because you do get led, led down the garden path with the mountains, they um, all of a sudden you're in a lot deeper and uh, more serious situation than you, you're meant to get into. But, uh, yeah, I would say that if the conditions are too rough or strong, then don't land, go fly somewhere else. So, yeah, that's <laughs> that's the ideal. <laughs> but, yeah, another time, well, that's what happened the second time when, Basically, it was really shady. Uh, the day I rounded uh, Mont Blanc, uh, so it was really like there's a layer of strata queue in the morning, but it was quite unstable. Um, but everything was shaded out, and I was sort of cruising around. I'd taken off near Verbier, and um, I was kind of sinking out a little bit. And finally, the sun came out in the spur across the valley, and I'm like, "Yep, I'm going there." So I went there, and there was like my most favourite. My favourite thermal of the X Alps. It was just awesome. Like, it was like, why have I been dealing with these crap thermals up until now? Like, it should have been more like this. It was just awesome. You just going straight up. And after that, I crossed to a spur. And meanwhile, in the, uh, is it the Rhone there? Yep. The Rhone is just on the back side, just just on the north side of, of Verbier there, the, the big one. Yeah. Yeah, so there was blowing like hell in there and a lot of the other guys were walking in that valley. And I crossed to this – I was sheltered in Verbier, but I crossed to the spur and there was just some really weird air where all of a sudden I went whoop up and then whoop back down. And I thought, hmm, maybe this isn't the best place to hang around. And I think I sort of decided to leave and then I just had this weird like weightlessness thing for a couple of seconds. And then I was looking down at the trees and going, I've got loads of clearance, but I think I'll get the hell out of here. And um, I did, and a few k's further on, uh, it was fine, and I kept flying. So, yeah, that that was kind of the two situations where the the air was like really notably extreme. But I guess there's a lot of times where it was a bit rough. But I guess that's one of my stronger points is that I am used to flying in, um, you know non sort of competition type conditions so that's something that i really enjoy is trying to figure out the non-classic situations and um yeah trying to figure out how to fly when there's a bit of wind that's what's really interesting about bulbiv and the excels for me kind of like uh being a fish swimming upstream aren't you're kind of hopping between <laughs> when it's you know when you it, it, watching the replay, you were one of two, I think, that got out of there that day. I mean, everybody behind uh, Ferdy and I, that, you know, we had that big day um, getting getting pretty much to almost to Chamonix, uh, and everybody that flew from the, from the Matterhorn back down into the Rhone just got totally stuffed. They didn't get out of there for a couple of days, some of them, it was really windy yeah, in there, it was, wasn't it? And it was, you. I think you and one other, the Spanish pilot were the only ones that got out of there. Yeah, it was definitely a good day. Um, I was pretty happy about that. I didn't really expect to do it myself. And I, yeah, I remember landing to get a drink of water once because I didn't have any water and then having a feed and just sort of chilling out for a bit and then taking off and flying to the Chamonix Valley. I'm like, whoa, that was good. So yeah, it's not like I planned the whole thing, but just took it one step at a time and yeah, it worked out well. Do you find that the X Alps makes you do things that you wouldn't normally do? Yeah, I, I had that impression from a lot of the pilots that they were pushing themselves to do things that they normally do. Um, but I think it wasn't really the case for me because in Volbiv, you've come across a lot of those situations before and in the X Alps, you're kind of 
got everyone watching you like you couldn't be much safer in terms of support at least mm. uh you know well you know it's you got first world infrastructure and and um no one's gonna not know that something happened it was just it was interesting listening to those stories and i i think it kind of put me back into a little more of a reality situation because you know when we when we finish something like that and we look back you know our our minds as humans tend to remember the good much easier than the the bad and to me the whole race was good it was just i couldn't believe how fun it was but i did forget a couple of those instances and i i like your your attitude there was was that hey you know you're flying vol biv that's what happens. And so you're kind of used to it. And that, that's a very positive look on it. And I, I also felt like I, I never did anything differently than I normally would have done if I was just flying around. But I, I, I guess what I'm asking is if, if you find that the race puts pressure on you in a way that is, does make it more risky. And, and if it sure. does, if it's, is it worth, I mean, is it, is it justifiable? Sure. So I did think of something to say about this and then I forgot it on the way. But, yeah, when I think about risk in the X-Alps, I think it's true that I'm a little bit more accustomed to it because Volbiv um, tends to get you in those situations. It's not to say I don't get scared, but, like, sometimes you get scared and you've just got to think. Like, one of the things that I used to think of is if I turn my Vario off, would I still be scared? Because the Vario sounds like it's going nuts. But really, if you turn it off, it's just like <sighs> pretty pretty relaxing. And the other thing is it might seem to me like the wing is going all over the place like crazy, but if someone was looking from the ground, is it actually that bad? Like you're getting a tuck here and there, you're moving back and forth, but does it actually look that bad? And, and kind of objectify things, it helps take – the fear out of it so uh in terms of risk there's there's fear which is can be subjective and then there's uh risk which is a bit more objective but of course your feelings make a big difference to the actual risk because it's all about decision making and confidence and if you aren't in the right headspace you're going to be increasing the risk a lot so Sometimes when you're in a pilot, you've got to just deal with things the best way you can and kind of be less emotional about it and, and more um, just doing the best in terms of inputs to your wing and decision-making, that kind of thing. But, yeah, when I think about risk in terms of people taking more risk for the X-Alps, I think, yeah, I'm fairly used to it, so I quite enjoy it generally. I still get scared sometimes. Often I think it's just a fear of uh, bombing out and having to walk back up the hill rather than physically hurting myself. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, it's hard to separate those out sometimes, you know, because especially with Volbiv, you load up and you're really heavy and you take off and, and you like really like got a lot of anxiety just before you take off because you're like, is this the right spot? Is it going to be okay? But then I'm like, well, hang on, there's grass everywhere. There's hardly any wind. Um, I'm just going to land at the bottom with the pack and the hot sun and maybe that's what's causing me to be scared yeah the the other example i'd like to bring up is um kriegel now do you think kriegel taste takes the most risks out of anyone in the x-alps gosh I, I no you know i don't i think he takes probably the least um i think he's exactly you know i think he's he's so good and he's practiced so much um that I think it's very methodical for him. I think it's very Swiss for him in his approach. Uh, if that maybe that's stereotyping too much, but I think, uh, yeah, no, I would agree with you. I think that he takes the least. Exactly. So basically, um, if you take more risks in the Alps than you're used to taking, then you probably will end up getting yourself in bad situations, and then it compounds, and then you make bad decisions because you've, uh, you're not in the right headspace. So uh, Kriegel hurt himself in a flight that was totally non-competitive and he said that that um, helped affirm him that he wasn't you know, too influenced by competition and he wasn't adjusting the risks um, just because it was a competition because it happened on a free flight that didn't matter. So, yeah, I think 
if you want to take his example, and it's a pretty good example to take, you should basically do what you're comfortable with and then you're going to perform a lot better. Mm. Nick, do you think in, in your, it sounds like 10 plus years of flying, do you, do you think that what separates, you know, pilots that can, you know, compete in things like the X Alps or, or, or competitions and do well, or just, you know, that let, let's call it the, the upper echelon of pilots versus the lower echelon. Do you think a big piece of that is, is being able to deal with things when they go bad? You were talking about, you know, that your one of your strengths is, you know, when it's, when it's windy or when it's nasty or when there's too much valley wind, you know, you're, you still get scared like every sane person does, but you're maybe dealing with it better, better. And by better, I mean calmer and faster. And you, you're, you're thinking about maybe options. This wasn't something I was planning on talking about, but I, you mentioned that. And I think that's maybe interesting because I, I get the question a lot from, from our listeners, you know, how are some people, they seem to be better with the same kind of hours as somebody that's, you know, that's, in other words, they progress very fast. Well, I think it's all just practice, and I don't think my progression is actually being fast. I, I um, like I, I said, I flew the beginning wing for two years. I didn't really do very big cross countries for a while. Like there was periods where I wasn't even, I was kind of like tethered to the hill kind of thing. Yeah, I'm just saying I'm kind of more used to that type of flying where there's a bit of wind around from doing wild biv trips, uh, especially in New Zealand, and also exploring places that I'm not used to. So I'm kind of used to doing something unfamiliar, like making unfamiliar things more familiar. And uh, I, I don't think it's anything special. I think there's a fairly sm small pool of us doing this and some of us have had the luxury to spend a bit more time on it. And it just happens to be that that's kind of my specialty because that's what I've spent most time on, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's a teachable skill? Really what you want to do is spend as much time learning at the best rate of learning. And I guess um, part of that is going out there and doing it and part of it is reflecting on it and trying to figure it out when you're on the ground, like processing it. So mostly I've definitely had a lot of people help me maybe like partly with the flying skills side and partly with the the sort of psychological approach or whatever but not like really it's just been driven by me trying to do these things on my own tell me about your your meteorology background are you finding that you know like you said being just a pilot you get really good at i kind of think all paragliders are pretty good at meteorology at some level depending on how long they've been doing it but are you finding that your your courses there and the uh i think you just said you just did this like eight or nine month course and now that's becoming your job are you finding that's affecting your flying in a in a positive way yeah it's hard to say i think it's like there's definitely been a few things that I've picked up out of the course that I kind of hadn't thought of before, but I'm basically doing the same thing as in trying to understand the physics behind everything when I'm flying and trying to figure it all out. And I guess now I've just got a little bit more to, to, to sort of ingredients to put in that mix and to try and figure things out. So definitely helps. Uh, the more you know and the, the, the quiet time you have thinking about things, like sometimes you figure things out afterwards, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But I guess most of what we learned in the meteorology course is sort of a larger scale thing. Like when I fly, typically I've got a crappy little phone with limited batteries and internet connections, so I don't actually spend much time or any time looking at the forecasts. I just get the most basic forecast I can if it's available and a lot of the places I go to it's not but yeah observing things and trying to figure out what's going on I guess the biggest thing that I've been learning in the meteorology course is more about like the upper air atmosphere um, and the broader scale stuff mm. you, you mentioned in your blog that you you flew that summer I realized this the, the blog was 
written or just posted now, but it was written a couple of years ago before the X ops, but you were talking about flying quite a bit without an instrument it sounded like because the instrument was broken, but also in a, in a sense, a, a choice. Is, is that something you'd, you'd recommend? Yeah. Well, um, so I think I mentioned that it kind of helped me fly faster because you wouldn't waste time in dribbles or lift and you just go on until you found something that was easy to, you know, obviously going up kind of thing. Yeah, it, it is good. Like I've always flown with very little instrumentation. Like I've been using my phone with XC saw, but the screen's turned off 99% of the time. I just turn it on if I want to check airspace or check my ground speed if something funny is going on. Or but now I've got a new instrument, so I can always see my glide, and that's kind of good and and ground speed. But yeah, the the most important thing always is to look out the window, isn't it? Because hmm. There's so many things that you can observe, and if you're looking at your instruments, you might be missing something. I mean, the instruments are pretty fancy, but, well, I'm, I'm there to, like, the reason I got into paragliding in the first place is to enjoy the view, so I don't really want to spend too much time uh, looking at a computer. Mm. That's savvy advice. Well, hey, let's uh, let's end this on a really on a really positive note, because uh, I'm asking you all kinds of really tough questions. Let me ask you an easy one. What's your most memorable flight? Was that supposed to be an easy question? <laughs> <laughs> It'd be impossible for me, but <laughs> uh, I was oh hoping I was hoping you'd have a like epiphany. Oh, well, it was that time in South America. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, since you mentioned it, like I guess I'm pretty impressionable. Um, <laughs> flying past um, Machu Picchu was pretty amazing. I'd sort of planned it a week in advance. I mean, not really planned it because I was not really sure if it was possible, but I started at a mountain pass that was, I don't know, four and a half, five thousand 5,000 metres, flew all the way down the valley into the wind before it picked up, like the valley wind, crossed past Machu Picchu, was, which was amazing, and then flew downwind in the valley, like getting 80, 90 k's an hour on glides um, with the valley wind picking up and getting higher and higher into more and more arid country, and then flying past Cuzco and then going back and landing a short walk from Cuzco. That was it was pretty amazing. And that was one of those flights. It was like, you know, the third day of a little bowl biv. And um, one of the ones where you go, wow, that really did happen. That's pretty amazing. Let's see what else I can try that might actually work. So, yeah, that, that was that was a good one. But I don't know. Um, okay. I probably wouldn't have said that that's I, one unless you mentioned South America. That, so. that's, okay, we have to – I have to <laughs> – just stop on that for a moment because I, I've been to Machu Picchu. I went went there with my mom. This is long before I knew anything. Yep. Maybe I, maybe I'd look at it with different eyes now. But that is absolutely insane. I remember the terrain in there, like the that river, the Urubamba or whatever it's called. It's like class five the whole way. There's there's I don't re- recall there being too many places to land. I mean, I, again, I was I wasn't a paraglider back then, so maybe I'd look at it differently now. But that that is an awesome flight. Yeah, it was it was amazing. Like, uh, it, it, it had me pretty stoked for for a while. And uh, yeah, the guys in Peru, I didn't get to meet with them, but they they were pretty um, keen to hear about that as well. But yeah, it, it, it always looks better when you're in the air. Like, there is a few landings around. Probably the part before I got to Machu Picchu was the worst. But yeah, it's um good place, Peru. Wow. Okay. Well, that okay. You, you hit it out of the park with that one. Can you can you give me another one? Do you have another best flight? Did another one pop in your mind? When you were telling that story. That that's insane. Do you have any pictures of that? Yeah, I do have a few. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, other flights in South America. they flying along the length of the Cordillera Blanca in Do you know what is in Peru? Like mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. where the mountaineers go with those six thousand meter mountains. Mm-hmm. That was the first place I got to 6,000 metres, and that was pretty awesome. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, couple, that was another little volbiv. But, yeah, there was a, there's a place up the valley there where I just looked at the map and went there a couple of times. You can catch a bus there for, I don't know, a dollar or something and or probably less. And then you walk up, and it's pretty crappy. Like, you go across, across this polluted river and then up through the scrub, but you just pull the wing up, and then you just, like, boom, like an elevator. It's, like, way faster than catching the bus up the hill. And then you've got a really long crossing, but after that you can just fly along these glaciated mountains. But, yeah, again, Peru's pretty crazy. Like, there's a lot of wind around and, um, yeah, but but quite 
a good way to see the country, isn't it? Yeah, don't the uh, don't the tandem pilots in Cusco land with skis because the you know the air is so thin and they they come in so fast to protect their clients. They they put some kind of skis on the bottom of their harness so they can just kind of slide in. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know what they do. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I heard anyway. But well, if you could oh. if you could uh, if you could just pack up today and go anywhere in the world to fly, where would you go? Ah. Uh. Well, probably New Zealand. Mm. <laughs> it's getting tired, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah. I I have been thinking about uh, places to go. I thought maybe China has got some really huge and amazing mountains, and it kind of isn't that well travelled. But it's actually my brother speaks Mandarin, and he I asked him about it a few months ago, and and he said, yeah, to be really straightforward in terms of politically, because I know in India it was a real hassle, like you're getting hassled by people and bureaucrats yeah. and everyone yeah. wants to see if you've got a permit and all this kind of thing. But it's like, yeah, China has no enemies. They don't, they won't care. So I don't know if it's true or not, but it'd be good to, to go out and do stuff without worrying about getting hassled, which is what I like about New Zealand. But yeah, China's got some big mountains, but I don't know. I haven't looked into it in detail. Maybe the weather's crap, but yeah. I should have um, mentioned one other place, and that's uh, your home ground, your your home turf. Mm. I kind of skipped that partly because I thought the US is an easy place to go to when you you got a shorter amount of time. But yeah, it looks like this. You guys have got a, a lot of stuff at home, so any of your um, listeners from the US, you don't need to to travel too far. As you said, it's some. Well, I'm sure there's a range of stuff over there, not just that hardcore Sierra Nevada stuff, but. No, yeah, there's there's a there's a little bit of everything. It's a, you know, it's just a massive place. You know that California's New Zealand in, on its own. It's just it's just huge. You know, there's cool. just so much there to. It's 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 almost daunting. <laughs> there's uh, For sure. yeah, there's not much reason to leave except that our you know we just I always feel like you get more hours and more time if you go to Europe just because it's you know the the weather is we just get a lot of unflyable days. You know, it's windy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. But yeah, um, you would do. Well, Nick, thanks so much. I really appreciate your time. And it was uh, really cool being able, being able to connect with you and Sydney and me at uh, Vancouver here, getting ready in about an hour. I'm going to be on stage uh, presenting North and Known to a bunch of folks, so that should be pretty fun. But uh, until we see each other again, I hope it's before the X Alps. But if not, we'll see you in a couple months in in Fushul. Yeah. Great. Looking forward to it. And have have a good uh, talk. I wish I could be there. Yeah, I wish I could do. Well, one one of these days we'll uh, we'll get to show it to you. Fantastic. Cool, man. Well, hey, thanks, and uh, talk to you soon. Thanks a lot. Yeah, cheers. I hope you enjoyed that. Always great to sit down with a fellow X Alps athlete and see what they're doing to get ready for the race and see their approach to all kinds of different things. That was uh, that was really good. I hope you got a lot out of that. Uh, as always, all we ask for is a buck a show. This is a listener-supported podcast. We don't have support uh, sponsors supporting it. Uh, if you can't contribute, then uh, there are many other ways. You can share it on a blog, you, on your own blog. You can share it on the social medias, uh, Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Uh, tell your friends. That's the that's by far the best way to to support the podcast and you can also rate us on itunes or stitcher or however you listen to the podcast um, that goes a long way that actually boosts the ratings and uh, makes it a lot more visible to other people that maybe don't know about the show uh, you can find links to support the show on cloudbasedmayhem.com either through paypal which is kind of a one-off or i highly uh, suggest if you if you'd like to support the show to use patreon uh, patreon.com forward slash cloudbasedmayhem uh, is another way where you can kind of set it and forget it. There's all kinds of special bonus material, including uh, I recently put up a little short recording that we did after the Larry Tudor podcast uh, about his magic bus tour in beer in India, and that's all I'll give you. It is absolutely hysterical. So head on over to Patreon and uh, check that out, and we'll see you on the next show. Thanks so much. See you at Cloudbase. <laughs>